Well, welcome everybody. I, I, I figured out, by the way, how to put my camera on the top of my computer like everybody else in the world does. So you're not going to get a side shot of me anymore. You're going to get a nose on. Um, did you ever notice that on, on coinage that you never have a front on, prof, a front on view of the person on the coin? Like Washington here. Well, that doesn't come out very good. Ah, oh, there, there it's decent, right? It's a side view, it's a profile. Why do you think that is? I have a theory. My theory is if they put it straight on that the nose would stick out of the stick out of the coin and probably wear off. That's what I think. What do you think? Do you think can you think of another reason? No? Okay, I got it down. Okay, today we were going to go over the homework problem, so let me uh, let me go ahead and do that. And um, I'm going to choose you randomly to make a presentation and I ask you to prepare some sort of audio, audio visual share. I will go to my security right now and I will allow people to share screens and we'll do it at one, at one at a time and I'll be gentlemen because we're all gentlemen here. Um, so let me put up my, put, put up, uh, let me share my screen. There it is, share screen. Man, look at all this stuff that pops up when I share my screen. That's a lot of stuff. I think I want to go here. No, I don't want to go there. I want to go here. No, I don't want to go. Oh, that's PowerPoint. Don't want to go here. I want to go here. Okay. Can everybody see the screen? Okay, if that's the case, let's uh, let's go through it one at a time. And um, let's see, I guess, David, you will be number one. This is on the order of my screen. Chris will be number two. Glauco will be number three. Aiden will be number four. And... Uh, one, two, three, four, and Adam will be number five. Who are we missing here? You're missing me. Oh, Justin, Justin. Justin isn't here. Okay. I'm right here. Oh, where, oh, oh you're, you fell off the end. Yep. Okay. Okay, so Justin, you're number six. And I, your friendly moderator, am number zero. So... So I have, I, have, uh, I have here four coins. The four coins are an American quarter, a Canadian dime, a plastic, uh, you probably can't see this, but this is a plastic coin that's very rough, but it has a obvious heads and tails, and an American penny, and the penny is, uh, whoa, 19, 1975, which is after, before most of you were born, right? Yeah, how about that? Okay, so you're going to have to trust me here because I can't show you the flips, but we'll do this. And I have now a um, a zero one one one. What is that? Seven. Uh, okay, we don't have seven, do we? So we have to redo it here. Okay, now we have a zero. Wait, how many coins do I need? Come on, you binary whizzes, you digital, digital three, geniuses. Three. three, and I'm using four. I'm going to get rid of my plastic one. And there's only one account that won't work, and that's seven, right? So now I have uh, one, one, zero. So that's six. Justin, you're up. Okay, so let's do um, number 25, and you can share your screen if you are so inclined. Okay. Screen. While you're doing it, the, the question that we're at, that we're asking is whether x of t is equal to a constant is band limited, and the answer that we said last time is yes, it was. And then oh. the question was, does the sampling theorem converge for all values of b greater than zero? Because that's that's an interesting question. I was like, okay, go ahead, Justin. 
Okay, so um, there's like two ways you can think about the problem, one geometrically and one um, working it out mathematically. Um, I did it geometrically here, and as you, if you plot, this is, all it is is a scaled um, sync function that is shifted at, very, at all integers in. And if you plot each function out, you can see that, you know, this metric, symmetric behavior of the sinks will kind of sum to a function of one. Um, but if you want to think about mathematically, um, it's kind of like problem 30, which is, I don't know, I guess I should save that for somebody else or. Okay. But, I mean, I guess, I don't know, I, I could talk it over, but the sink, if you do take the limit as the sink, or take the limit as B goes to zero from going from a positive number approaching zero, um, the shifted sink will compress down to an impulse function. And then that would just give you the sink of, or the impulse of N over all integers. And that would just give you an impulse at all integer values, which would go to a function of evaluate it to one. So it all, so yes, that is true. Yeah, I think it's obvious from the equation you have here, for example, if you substitute B is equal to zero, um, you have the summation of N is equal mm -hmm. to one to infinity of, you know, it works for B is equal to zero. I never noticed that. Yeah. It works for B is it equal to actually. zero. Isn't that interesting? Okay, yeah, I never noticed that. I always thought that B would have to be greater than zero. The reason is, is that summation of the sink of 2BT minus N, if you substitute B is equal to zero, you get the sink of N. Didn't we say that was a chronic or delta? Mm -hmm. And the summation over that chronic or delta is equal to one. Yep. So that's, I don't know, I think that's curious. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, you can quit, right. share, you can quit sharing your screen now. If, you, right. if you're so, if you're so inclined, uh, let's uh, let's look at the next one. Uh, this one this one's interesting. Is one, frankly, I don't know the answer to, but I wanted to find out what the answer is. So, um, so that's the reason that I assigned it. This is number twenty six, and what it does is it looks at the Nyquist rate and compares the criteria for wave files, for uncompressed files. Now, clearly, if you have a file which you compress to a, what, what's the compression? Uh, MPEG, I believe. If you compress it to an MPEG, yeah, it's, it's not going to follow the Nyquist rate because it takes into account the redundancies that occur in the samples. But uh, the wave file is uncompressed and doesn't, uh, doesn't do that. So let's... Um, Let's see what happens here. There's three questions are kind of related. What is the sampling rate used in the WAV file uh, compared to the Nyquist rate, assuming humans can't hear above 20 kilohertz? That's usually a pretty safe, uh, safe uh, uh, frequency of 20 kilohertz. And then what is the byte size of each sample? I don't know that, but I do know that smaller byte sizes are going to decrease the, uh, the accuracy of the reconstruction. Clearly, because we have round off error, and round off error, round off error in your X's is going to manifest itself as error here also. You know what? Am I sharing my screen? No, I I was uh, seeing you um, <laughs> on my okay. Uh, browser. <laughs> okay, I was okay. Well, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't doing very well there. Look at that. You can tell what I was doing before, the stability plasticity dilemma. Everybody knows what that is, right? We all get into our own little dilemmas. Uh, well, where did my homework go? Did I erase it? You know what? I think <laughs> I think I'm, I, I, I've just oh there it is there it is okay. Can you see it? No, you cannot see it. I knew that. 
No, it says I am sharing my screen. Yeah, I, I can see your uh, Adobe Acrobat. Uh... Okay, yeah, that's so. That's what we. Uh, oh, I don't want the Adobe Acrobat. You know what? I think that in my brilliance, I closed the uh, I closed the homework. I think before the next uh, the the next lecture, I have to close all my windows. Do you think that'd be a good idea? I got too many windows open. There should be a name for that for people that have too many windows open. Anybody have an idea? I found out there was a name. Do you ever go in a restaurant and like the waitress wears their COVID mask below their nose? And you know, that's a little spooky because that means it, it's not working, right? Um, you know the name for that? It's called a chin diaper. I thought that was a great name for that thing below the nose, a, a chin diaper. They're all stacked up at the very bottom of your screen there. <laughs> yeah, I know. What's the deal? Okay, now my mouse is freezing. Guys, you never let a computer know that you're in a hurry. Okay, finally, let's see if I, if I don't lose it this time. By the way, I just got new Wi-Fi, I'm glad to tell you. Oh, I changed the thing at the bottom of the uh, screen. Can two basketballs fit side by side through a standard basketball hoop? Depends if they're inflated or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, okay. Let me be more. All right, there it is. I clear up the problem. That's a good one, Justin. That was good. In, in the horizontal plane also. What's that? In the horizontal plane, they should be. Yeah, side by side, and yes. Side, okay. side by and the, side. And, and oh, the basketball oh. hoop is in position. <laughs> yeah, the, the basketball hoop is in position. That's right. Boy, you guys have made good lawyers. You know, this is the sort of uh, word gaming that they use. What do you think? Definitely, it happens sometimes when people are, a lot of people are shooting around and if the two land in at the same time, they can get stuck in the net. So two can fit in the hoop, but they'll get stuck in the net. It happens okay. sometimes. You're right, you're right. Uh, that kind of surprised me. Two basketballs uh, can go through a hoop, not the net, but they can go through a hoop at the same time. I thought the hoops were a lot more narrow than that. But I wonder if that's the standard is to make the basketball hoop too two basketball diameters. So I, I just looked up the numbers. Looks like they can't do it perfectly. The, a standard hoop has a diameter of 18 inches and the standard basketball is 9.51 inches. Oh, so I have been misinformed. Well, they're filled with air so they can squeeze. Yeah, no, that doesn't, that, that, that's, that doesn't meet the spirit of the problem. But if they come in at a certain velocity, their velocity can push them through. They could get stuck, but I've never seen two basketballs get stuck in the hoop. Is anybody? No. Do you see that nobody's watching bas NBA basketball anymore, which is understanding. Okay, uh, so let's get back. I'll, I'll kind of restate the problem again. Consider uncompressed wave files. What's the sampling rate compared to the Nyquist rate, assuming humans can hear above 20 kilohertz? And what is the bite size of each one of the samples? Um, so with that, I'll do the flipping of the coin. And we will not use Justin, although we could. I do allow sampling with replacement, but not today. Okay, this is uh, tails, heads, heads. That's uh, three. Who's the lucky number three? That's me. Okay, Glauco. What did you What did you find out? Um, this is the 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 wave format of the files, isn't it? Yeah, I want to compare the wave file Nyquist, the wave file sampling rate with a Nyquist rate of 20 kilohertz. Okay, that's 26. I, 
I found uh, I was uh, in my hometown. I was responsible for the recordings of the preachings. Okay. A church. So a church. Could, could you make that a little bigger, please? Yeah. So we had a, a professional. I should be no. I, we had a professional recorder, and it, the recordings were, were in in wave format, but you you could choose uh, both the the sampling rate and the and the sample size. So depending on on what you choose, uh, they will use more memory or less. And then I I used to process to process them afterwards to compress and share online. So. Um, all my answers are ranges, but there is some some standards. So the most common uh, for the sampling rate is. Um, do you see my cursor? Yes, we do. Okay. For the sampling rate, the the, the most for audio files, the usual is 44k. It's a um, 10 percent bigger than the Nyquist rate. That is uh, double the the 20 ka ka kilohertz. Okay, now again, 20 kilohertz is a number that I used for memory. So yeah, so so it 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 fits with the with the standards because they usually use uh, 44, and half of that is a little bit more than 10 percent more than that that number you you used. So okay, it makes, it makes sense because it provides some oversampling, and uh, and not too much. So yeah, that makes sense. Also, the the format, the wave format format allows till gigahertz of frequency. So they use it that format for for other purposes, more rather not only for audio files. But, yeah, and the byte side is also the usual is a uh, 16 bits. That's two two bytes per sample. But uh, I found files uh, in, in Wikipedia references, browsing them, of of different sides of, of sample, from one byte to eight bytes, and so. And also, yeah, two other interesting uh, data is that they can use multi-channel up to sixty-five thousand channels <laughs> for audio. It's uh, usually is. Two, two channels for a stereo. Five, what what, what five, do you mean by 65,000 channels? Channels uh, is what the standard wave format allows to. So for audio files, more than five or seven, maybe nine. I, I'm not sure about the industry. They use five channels or sometimes for cinema, they use 32 channels for audio files. Oh, I see. In order to get like stereo and quadro and uh, surround yes. sound, yes. I see. Wow! Imagine sixty-five thousand different speakers coming at oh, you at different, yeah. no, uh, different, I, different angles. Definitely, that that if they use so much channels, it's it should be for other purposes, not for listening. <laughs> oh, what, what 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 would they use it for, for example? Oh, I I don't know. I, I will have to check again Wikipedia. <laughs> that the source the source of all knowledge okay yeah um, it, it, now when when i am given the chance to convert a recorded file i usually am given the choice between like um uh wave and the compressed formats and uh and there must be a standard for those because at least in the software i use they do not give me the chance to dictate the sampling rate they don't dictate the file size do you know what is, what is default clearly you're using software that allows more uh, more freedom here they they they, they 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 are more standard the mp3 formats i think there may be a couple of of options in mp3 but definitely for wave uh, for WAF audio files is there are abroad options but for those compression formats they are narrower i don't know exactly for each one but okay okay well thank you anybody find the wave default numbers no okay well at least we have we have a ballpark here so that's good okay thank you glauco very good unsure your screen
your screen is unshared. Now I will share my screen. And we are on now Parseval's theorem. We know from Parseval's theorem that, uh, that the following is true, that the energy in a signal, that's the energy, uh, can be determined by summing up the squares of the sample at or above the Nyquist rate and then dividing by one over two B. Um, is the following also true? In other words, if you just want the area under the signal, can you simply count up the samples and divide by one over two B? Again, I think, I don't know, it interests me that the one over two B has to be there in order to have a dimensional match between the left side and the right side, right? Both of, both of them have to have that T variable there. So I have caught more math mistakes just checking units. Okay, so who's, who's the lucky person? Okay, we have uh, my random number generator says zero, zero, <laughs> zero, that's me. No, <laughs> I, already, I, already gave a, uh, I already gave a solution, so that doesn't count. Okay, let's try uh, uh, heads, tails, heads. That's six, but we've done that already. Wait, how many do we have left? Four. Heads, tails, heads is five. It is five. Okay, five. Sorry. I'm having a bad, five. I'm having a bad binary day. Okay. Five is me. Five is you. Okay, Adam. Screen. There. All right, there we go. Twenty seven. Uh, let's see if I zoom in. Right. Oh. So if you start off just with the uh, the cardinal series for x of t here, and then you integrate both sides. So you have the integral of x of t over here, matching the left side we're trying to find. And then you take the integral and you put it inside the summation onto the sink. Uh, then you just take the integral of the sink, it becomes one over two b. How, how do you know that? How do you know the integral of the sink is one over two b? It is, but I, I don't remember how I found that. That was last week. <laughs> oh, I think you're trying to match the solution to the problem. Okay. Well, I I, I I found it some way. I didn't just assume it, but. <laughs> But, well, remember, remember the integral property. The integral over a function is equal to the, its Fourier transform evaluated at zero, right? The right. integral of a function is equal to its Fourier transform evaluated at zero. So the so Fourier transform of the sink is the rectangle function. Yes. Uh, and we have a scaling of 2b, so there would be, be 1 over 2b, yep. the rectangle function of 2b u uh, with a shift. We don't care about the shift because we're at zero. So yes, it'd be one over two B. Okay, so, okay, that's great. Very, very nice, uh, succinct uh, result. You can shop, stop sharing your screen now. That, that worked very good. Okay. The next one uh, is a little bit harder. You notice as, as these go along, they get a little bit harder. So 28 is two ways to compute the derivative of a band-limited signal. Both of these, if x of t is a band-limited signal, then the derivative of x of t is also a band-limited signal. And it has the same bandwidth of x of t because, well, you multiply by j2 pi u, and if it's zero outside, you multiply by j2 pi u, it's still zero out, outside. So you don't have to you don't have to worry about the band limited this of it. You know it is band limited. And here are two ways to compute the derivative of a band limited signal. The first one is to sample the, sample the uh, derivatives of the signal. The second way is to take the original cardinal series and just differentiate on both sides, in which case you get a derivative of the sink. So now we're down to four, right? Let's uh, do this as... Let's see. We're no, we're down to three, aren't we? Yeah, we've had three. We're down to three. So uh, Adam, uh, who hasn't gone yet? Aiden and uh, David. 
Okay, David, you're number one. Um, Aiden, you're number two. And who am I missing? But Chris dropped out. Oh, that's right. Chris, Chris, uh, as an excuse, he had to go somewhere. So we only have two. Okay, David, your heads. Well, I dropped, I dropped my coin on the floor. Okay, I'll flip another one. Okay, heads, David, you're up. Let's see, um, I'll change my camera. Let's see. Whoa, you got an overhead camera. Yeah, it's a it's a document camera. It's a, let's see, I'll move it closer to the light. But, uh, All right, so can we share that, your uh, sh share your screen, please? Oh, um, oh, my camera is the uh, screen that I'm sharing. We, yeah, we can choose a, a speaker view, so it appears in big. Uh, Okay, is that me or is that uh, David? Yeah, if you right click the video yeah. of him and hit pin, it will bring it up big. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody see it now? You have to do it individually, I think. No, I, d I did it on David, so I'm seeing it. I'm seeing David's, but oh, everybody has to do it individually. Okay, so everybody has to go on David's and, and click pin. Okay, thank you. All right, so. So yeah, um, given the uh, definition of the um, uh, um, yeah, cardinal series, we can um, just the same way as we can say x of t equals sum over n of x of n over 2b sink of 2b t minus n, we can say x prime of t equals sum of X prime sink, and and we can also say X prime of t is equal to d by dt of the uh, cardinal series of x, and um, we can move the derivative inward um, until we get to the only term that has a t in it, and and um, because x prime of t equals x prime of t, we can say sum over n of x prime of n over 2b sink of 2b t minus n is equal to sum over n of x of n over 2b times d by dt of sink of 2b t minus n. Just a general comment, everybody. When you're presenting equations that are already written down, you say in a result, as a result of this, this side, and then point to the okay. left side, is equal to the right side. Now, often when I'm writing things down in real time, I, I go through and I, I talk about the equation that I'm writing down. But just as a presentation idea, it's never good to read an equation. So every, every, everybody does it, but that's just a, uh, just a suggestion. It's not a rule, it's a suggestion. Perfect, David, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, we get Aiden, and um, Aiden gets the hard problem, doesn't he? Oh, my gosh. How do I get so unlucky? This is the only one I couldn't do. It's all right. Okay. Same here. So. <laughs> okay, did, did anybody get this? This is, this is a hard problem. I mean, well, I did what you told us to in class, but I still missed. I, yeah. There's, there's a typo in the problem. So that doesn't help. <laughs> oh, what's the what's the typo? It should be sync of two BT, not W. You're exactly right. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, Adam saved everybody uh, because this is my fault, and you can't work a problem if it's improperly posed. So we Wait, use that. Are we doing 31? I thought we were, did we skip 29? Because that's what I thought we were doing. Um, 
Yeah, 29, same thing. It should be a 2BT. So uh, 29, 30, and 31 we'll save for next time. You say that you watched the video and you didn't quite get it. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I made progress, but uh, yeah, I just kept, let's see, what did I do? Um, yeah, so that's what I did. I ended up with summation. I guess I can show you, right? If you let me share. Yes, please let me stop and you can start. Okay, um, so what did I do here? Yeah, so I got to I got to this point. I can't. I'm trying to remember how I did it now. I barely remember. Okay, yeah. So I just started with the, with the definition right here. Yes. And then. Uh, Where did I get this from? I'm trying to remember where oh, that came from. Well, you're oversampling, so if you run it through a low-pass filter, you get the same result. Yeah, so that's basically what I did here. Yep. And then what I ended up with the two sinks, right? And so I Fourier transform. I wanted to simplify this is where I got to. And so I wanted to simplify this by uh, looking at it in the frequency domain instead because it's just multiplication. And so when I got down to here, the problem was I kept just ending up with sync of this, which isn't supposed to be what we get. So what happened was. Uh, I can tell you what your problem is. See the third equation from the bottom? Yeah. So I figured there's supposed to be a coefficient here, but I don't no, know how. No. Uh, oh, yeah. There should be a 1 over 2b squared out in front of it. Because of, the, because of the scaling theorem. The other thing is e to the minus j2 pi un. You notice that that does not, that that does not pass the, uh, the, the dimensional check, right? That should be over 2b, I believe. Let's see. Yeah, no, that should be over, no, that should be over 2w. Okay, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure, I'm not understanding what you're saying. You mean because of the scaling theorem? Yeah, let me, let, 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 me, kind of, let me kind of help here. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Yeah, you got it right. I believe that you had, help me out here, you had the sink of what? 2WT minus N? Yes, sir. Convolved with the sink of what? 2B times sink 2BT. Okay, we okay here? There's a 2B in front of the second sink. Oh, it's a, okay, 2B or not 2B, okay. So this has, this has a Fourier transform, and I'm really good at this, as you can probably tell, is one over two W. I, I'll screw it up after bragging here. Uh, U over two W. But I have to be a little bit careful here. I have to rewrite this as the sink of two W. I have to get what the shift is. Right, I have to get that n over two w there. So this is my shift. So this is the shift is going to be e to the minus j. Here I am reading the equation. Right, but notice this trick. I had to get the shift in there. I had to get this n over two w in there in order to mitigate the shift. And then this thing, the second thing, simply Fourier transforms of pi over pi of u over 2b. Okay, we okay so far? I'm not understanding why the two w's in the, in the exponential. 
because you're shifting the normal sink and not the Oh, here, here's what I'm doing. I'm taking the sink. I'm trying to Fourier transform this. Trying to Fourier transform this. But in order to do this, I have to get a clean, sh uh, a clean shift. In other words, I have to isolate the T here. Otherwise, a the shift theorem doesn't apply. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. The shift theorem only applies at t, the function of t minus whatever it is. So it isn't two w t minus whatever it is. It's t minus whatever it is. So I have to rewrite it in this case. Now we're applying two theorems at once here. We're applying the shift theorem and the scaling theorem. The scaling theorem says I bring out a one over two w and I get a rectangle function of the unshifted function. And for the uh, shift, I get the following. Is that more clear now? Yes, thank you. Okay. So that's the reason that we obtain this result. And now I'm going to continue with this result by recognizing that pi of u over 2w, and you had this in your, in your equation, Here's the geometrical interpretation of it. We had uh, oversampling from minus w to w. And then the bandwidth was from minus b to b. So we're multiplying this dashed line rectangle function, which goes to 1, times the solid line rectangle function, which also goes to 1. And you can see when we multiply the two, we only get the inner one, right? Is that clear or would you like me to elaborate? Yeah, no, I, I had that. I just didn't get the, uh, the correct transform of the- Yes, one. right, it, it's the whole thing. So all of this up here is equal to um, one over two W times e to the minus j, two pi u, and over two w, read the equation, Bob, times pi over u over two b, right? Left out the two b. Where, no, I don't think I left out a two b. Where did I leave out a two b? Um, the second line, um, to be in front of uh, yeah there's a 2b in front of the sink but that's sucked in by the pi of u over 2b oh okay oh okay okay so that's okay you said okay so i'm assuming you under, understand it so now we have to inverse fourier transform this right well we first of all get the inverse fourier transform of this guy which is 2b times the sink of t right or sink of 2bt. But then we have this shift. So we have a t minus n over 2w, right? And then I also have to bring down this 1 over 2w. So this, that's not equivalent, this inverse Fourier transform. So let me put a little inverse Fourier transform here. So that inverse is Fourier transforms to this. You will notice that this coefficient is r. And then if we expand this out, we get the sink of 2bt minus rn. So hopefully after struggling with that a little bit, we can see this. Ho hopefully that clears things up. And you know, there is a lot of bookkeeping here, right? There is a lot of bookkeeping. Fortunately, we have things like Mathematica today that'll, that does some of this bookkeeping for us.
Any questions? We had a professor when I used to be at the University of Washington. I was thinking about this and drinking my coffee and wondering if you could hear my lips smack and me swallowing. Well, uh, my colleague at the University of uh, Washington taught online and part of his, it was a blended class. And most of his students worked at Boeing since University of Washington is close to Boeing. And uh, people just laughed at his lectures. He thought he was really, really funny because in the middle of his lectures, you would hear this grumble, grumble, grumble. And everybody thought that was curious. And then they finally figured it out that my colleague, when he was lecturing, had his microphone draped around his neck, much like earbuds. And what you were hearing was the grumblings of his belly because it was right before lunch. And everybody, everybody heard this guy's grumbling of his, of his belly. So <laughs> anyway, that's, that's an amusing anecdote as we, uh, as we talk here. Okay, I think we're, we're up to that. So with that, what I'd like you to do is I would like you to, uh, for next time, as I would like you for next time to work these out Okay, work this one out. I just worked this one out for you. So it's a very interesting result. Uh, you'll notice that one manifestation of this is that um, the sinks don't go through the zero crossings anymore. There's a dependence among the sinks. And I, I'll talk about that maybe next time. But I would like you to, um, to answer 29, I'd like you to work it out for your own edification just to duplicate what I've done. And I would like you to do 30 and 31 also. Thanks. Yes, question? Um, no, I just had on 31, that should say using problem 29, right? Uh, C problem 20. Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you catching the typos. Isn't it interesting how we're able to, I always found it interesting how we're able to detect errors just by checking consistencies like that. I think we, you just deleted 29, problem 29. Yeah, I, I think what I did is, no, I, I, I think I did 29, then I did 30, and then I went back and stuck another problem in there and I didn't update it. The updating, oh, okay. the, up, the updating is not automatic. Okay, okay any other questions? Yeah, so wasn't this due today? Yes, it was, but I'm not going to hold you responsible for, 20, for uh, 29 through 32. No, 30, <laughs> 31. Uh, can I just ask a quick question about 31? Sure. Uh, I, I, I worked the problem, and so I, I don't really, you know, I'm not trying to get you to solve the whole thing, but I'm curious about how you set zero, you set T equal to zero on the left side, but then on the right, T is not equal to zero. How does that work? Because I would have guessed that you would have to set both equal to zero. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, did anybody get this problem? Well, like I said, I worked it, but I set T equal to zero. And so my result looks like yours, but the sign, it's only sync of negative RN. That's what oh, I did. I, I didn't really right, understand right, right. why the T was still there. Yep, you're right. Sorry about that. Okay. Another typo. Now with this correction, did anybody get this? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Three people. Excellent. Excellent. Did you get it with, uh, with the correction that I just made? Okay. Well, if you want to and you've done it already, just go ahead and hand it in and uh, we won't worry about it. But for those of you that were screwed up by my mistakes, you can hang, you can hand it in on Thursday, let's say. Is that okay? Is that fair? Good. Thank I have you. one more question. Yeah. Um, do you still want us to upload these to the box? Even though yes. we're presenting them? Okay. Yes, please. Yes, I want you to upload them to the box. To the box. And the one we've the ones we've done uh, already uh, right away. Yes, do the ones you've done, and then I will look at whatever you submit on uh, Thursday as an addendum to what you did today. Is that fair? Yeah. 
Okay. So I will actually look at uh, Thursdays before I look at Tuesdays. Guys, great job. I'm, I'm, I'm more impressed with you than you should be of me <laughs> because, because of the mistakes I made. Uh, great job. You, uh, you understood what was going on. So I appreciate that. Okay. David, I'm going to pin myself because I'm the one that's talking. Okay. With that, let's, uh, if there's no more questions, let's go back to the lecture. And um, I want to have some fun today. So let me share my screen again. Do you remember last time we talked about some interesting manifestations of higher dimensions? And this is one of the things that I'm hoping that... Uh, that we're doing here is to try to get you to think in higher dimensions. Certainly physicists do it. I think we talk about mathematically high dimensions a lot, but we don't look at the manifestation of them. And we look at different things such as walking through walls, of, of breaking chains, and of turning left-handed pictures into right-handed pictures if we had access to the fourth dimension. I find all of this astonishing. I don't know how you feel about it. And then Stephen Hawking's argument why, boy, we're really gr glad that when God created our universe that he created it in three dimensions instead of two dimensions because of that digestive tract that has to go from our mouths and then uh, the food after it's digested exits. And he makes the point of a dog that if you were in two dimensions and you had this tube going through you that you would have to separate if you were in two dimensions. And yes, that was a serious physicist, uh, Stephen Hawking, making that point. So uh, let's, let's talk a little bit more about visualizing higher dimension. This is Ronald Fisher. He is probably the greatest statistician of the 19th century. Maybe in the 20th century. I forget when he lived. But he, was, uh, uh, he, he really did a lot of stuff. And you hear of a number of things that's named after him. Anybody heard anything named after Fisher? I don't Fisher know what the toy company is. What's that? <laughs> the what, Adam? The, the toy company? I'm guessing that's not him. Fisher. Is Fisher, Fisher a toy? Price? Fisher oh, Fisher Price. Price. No, 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 no. No, they have nothing to do with statistics. Okay, David? Uh, let's see. The Fisher discriminant? Uh, yes. Not that I remember exactly what that is. <laughs> yeah, and another one is Fisher Information. Um, and there are many, there, there's kind of a conflict. Um, and, and believe it or not, this is really interesting. There was a movie starring Bob Gold, Gold, uh, Bobcat Gaither. I forget who it was. But it's a story about mimes and clowns. And uh, the clowns would go around, they would make people happy, but they hated the mimes, even though both were trying to entertain. And the clown car went around and... Uh, they saw these mimes and all of these clowns jumped out of the car. You've ever seen like 20 people come out of a clown car and they went over and they were going to beat up the mimes and the mimes were over there. They were all scared. They were putting up uh, uh, <laughs> fake walls, which, which didn't work. And so the, the clowns broke through and beat up the mimes. And there was really no explanation for this bigotry, this back and forth. Believe it or not, this happens quite a bit in mathematics and science. Uh, one of them is a continuing debate between the so-called Fisherians, or I believe it's called the Fisherians, people that follow Fisher's model of mathematics and statistics, and Bayesians. And the Fisher people hate the Bayesians. The Bayesians hate the Fishers. And I, I don't know. I like them both. But I've, I've, met, I've met people on both, uh, both sides, and it's very interesting to hear them discount the other one's uh, ideas. But Fisher was a great guy. He was also one of these guys that was into eugenetics. You, what do they call that? Eugen, um, eugenics is the word I'm looking for. Has anybody heard of eugenics? Yeah, it was a, it, it was it was a it was a uh, a movement based on Darwinian evolution that said there were some people on the planet that were inferior to other peoples, and it was it started in the United States and it it went over to Germany where Adolf Hitler got the idea and thought that the, that the Germans were the superior race, everybody else was inferior, and he had to whack them all off. 
And if you want to see a chilling, um, just a, a chilling documentary that shows the social effects of an acceptance of eugenics and Darwinism, there's a great movie on Netflix called The Human Zoo, The Human Zoo. And get a chance to watch it. It's not very long, but it shows that um, it shows that science is can be politicized, and we're seeing science politicized today. And this was a credible political politicalization of science in uh, eugenics, which has since been debunked. But nevertheless, then it was it was science, and we had people such as the Smithsonian and Harvard and Yale and uh, MIT. They all bought into this idea of eugenics, which is now discredited. Human zoos, if you get a chance, watch it. It's, it's just a chilling documentary. But Fisher was one of these eugenicists, and so he believed in, in um, that there were some people on the earth that were higher evolved than other people. Um, but nevertheless, despite that, he did really, really great work. One of the things that is very interesting is that everybody has their ideology, and usually truth wins out over ideology. And so if, if you have something which is true, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay on and it's going to stick. And Fisher's ideas have, have stayed on and they've stuck insofar as his mathematics. But he was one of these other guys that was famous in one field and came out and started talking about another when he didn't know what he was talking about, basically. Anyway, one of the things that Fisher did in order to test one of his uh, hypotheses is go out and he collected all of this data on irises. And... He went out with a ruler, and I don't recall what these mean, but the, the iris had a setosa of a various color and a blue, so he, so he looked at three different types of irises, and he measured the different dimensions of each of these three different types of virus. He measured the sepal length, the sepal width, the petal length, and the petal width. Ask me what septal is. Sepal, I, I forget. Anybody know what sepal is? It's like these leaves looking things that are kind of under a flower. Okay. It's, it's just part of a flower. I don't think they all have them though. Okay, but the iris probably has one. So he took one and he measured the longest dimension than the shortest dimension. And then the question is, this, this kind of goes back to artificial intelligence. If you had a, the dimensions, all of these four values, could you classify them? Well, this was four-dimensional data, right? This was four-dimensional data. So how do you represent it? Well, this is a screenshot from Wikipedia that shows one of the ways that you can represent higher dimensional data is through projections. Here we have a number of points, and they're projected down on two different planes, and we can see that there's, you know, there's separation. So this is a good way to visualize data. One of the things if you ever do, if you ever get into representation of data, make sure that you try to become friends with the data before you do any data crunching, because being coming friends with the data lets you know uh, what you should do and where you, sh where you should go. You're developing domain expertise, and anytime you're trying to do classification like an AI or anything, you need to become friends with the data because the more domain expertise you bring to the problem, the better the result is going to be. But the point here is the representation, which is done in Wikipedia, the Fisher Iris data. And you can see it's, it's kind of clear what it is. Now, how would what's another way to represent um, represent data, and we're going to talk about this a little bit. One of the questions I have want to ask you is about a black, well, let's see. No, let, let's, let, let's do a color, a, a color movie that you're streaming. Is that color movie that you see on your screen that you're watching on Netflix, is that a two-dimensional function? Well, that's something to think about as we go on, and I will define a two-dimensional function, and we'll see if it is or not. And uh, interestingly, no, it is not a two-dimensional function. Okay, let's get back to visualizing this higher-dimensional data. Here, here's a game we used to play. You know when you're stuck at the airport or something, and you just have a paper and pencil? You play a higher-dimensional 
you, you play fun games. You ever do those little dots and everybody connects the uh, dots. And if you get a square, you put your initial in it and, you know, you see who gets the most initially. This is another fun game. It's a three-dimensional tic-tac-toe. Now, interestingly, you can't do a three-dimensional cube when you're sitting at the airport waiting for your plane. So what you do is you represent this two-dimensional object in three dimensions. And you can see here that we take the top we, we take the top plane, we represent it in the, in, as the top four by four quadrant here, and we represent each parallel plane by an additional uh, plane. And immediately we can see the pattern of the three-dimensional winning of tic-tac-toe. A winning combination is any combination through which you can pass a line. If you can pass a line through the combinations, then you have a winning combination. So we see the black squares here, for example, form a winning combination. If we have four elements in a row, uh, that corresponds to a winning calculation. Or if we have elements here in the bottom left of each one of the squares, uh, that corresponds to the four elements over here, we obtain four elements in a row. Does everybody see this? Okay, so that's that's kind of obvious. If you've never played it before, uh, I want to try this. Oh man, these are all the windows I opened before that stuck at the bottom of the screen, right? Okay, if you've, if you've never tried this before, um, uh, <laughs> Okay, I don't know what happened to my original screen. Let me let me just try this. I want two of you to volunteer to play three-dimensional tic-tac-toe. Anybody want to volunteer? David's going to volunteer, and I need one more volunteer. Uh, okay, Adam, you're going to I'll volunteer. Do. What's that? No, I was just saying I'll do it, yeah. Okay, that's great. Now you can see the uh, the results the results here. I probably got to get it to a lower resolution. Okay, maybe even lower than that. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share this with you, and I'm going to share it in the chat screen. And you're going to have to take this. Uh, you're going to have to take this. And open it up on your own screen. OK, where am I at here? OK, I think I probably have to quit sharing in order to chat. Yeah, I do. <laughs> of course it doesn't share. Okay, I don't care. Thank everybody for their patience. Okay, David, Adam, I'd like you to open up your links. And we don't want to take the rest of the class. What I'm going to do is I'm going to allow you five seconds each to make a play. You know, like when they play chess and they bang the, uh, bang the buzzer, right? So let me know when you have it up. And I want everybody to look and tell me when David or uh, Adam win, okay? I've got it up. Uh, maybe I'll use X. Well, this yeah. is this is negotiation with uh, with Adam. Uh, that's fine, but I, I noticed we, we don't have edit privileges. No, I gave you edit privileges. Oh, uh, can, okay. It says view only, and then I can request edit access to change that. Okay, let me try again. Could you see my screen? Yes. Okay. A 
Okay, if this doesn't work, I'm going to play a game of kickboxing with my computer. <laughs> okay. Try, try this one. We can edit with the same link. We only have to update the, the page. The page. Yeah. Okay. yeah, okay, I'm refreshing, it's loading. If it works. Okay, so you have the ability now to uh, to change things, right? Yeah. Okay, so who's going to be X's? David's X's? Yeah. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call out your name. If I didn't call out your name, you're not allowed to move. And you only have five to move. So David, you go first. And then after David moves, Adam, you have, you have five seconds to make your move. And if anybody sees a winning combination, let me know, okay? Okay, go ahead, go. Okay, okay. let's see. Um... Lost your time. Oh. Nope, you can't move, Adam. David? Adam? No, David, David. Oh. Adam? David? Um. Adam? Anybody see a winner here? David? Adam? Uh, that should have won for me. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Adam won. Oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, did everybody see this? He got here, he got here, he got here, and he got here. Everybody agree? Mm. And I don't know why this one was white. I didn't mean it to be white, but we have zero, 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 zero. So congratulations, Adam. And let's see, David was going for, he probably had some sort of strategy that I don't see here. So anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of cool. Thank you for playing. Now, the next thing I want to go to is um, something interesting is can we play four-dimensional tic-tac-toe? And the answer is yes. We have a five by five grid, a five by five grids. And each one, each, each slice through this corresponds to a three-dimensional cube. So we can literally visualize a line in four dimensions using this two-dimensional representation. And I'll show you, well, some examples. For example, uh, see this black cube down here? See the black cube? Black cube, black cube, black cube, black cube, right? That's a line. The, this clearly is a line. Going down this way, we have a three-dimensional cube. Um, Going down this way in the leftmost column, we have a three dimensional cube. So here, 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 and here correspond to a, a line going through the cube. Can you see the idea? So this is four dimensions, which we represent in two dimensions. Now tell me that ain't cool. So I'm wondering if anybody has the guts To go to the second sheet, and you'll have to, uh, gosh, I don't know why that's so, I guess I have to go down even further. I don't know why that's so small. I think your, your Chrome is zoomed in. My Chrome is zoomed in? Yeah, there's a separate zoom for Chrome and Google Docs. 
Okay, tell me what to do. Where do I go? What do I do? Uh, hit control zero. Oh my, I have never hit control zero in my life. Okay. I guess that works if you're not in Google Sheets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, in the top uh, right corner, there's a magnifying glass by the star. And if you click it, you should be able to reset to the left of that. Right there. Reset. Oh. Now you can just zoom in and docs, and I think it'll look okay. Or use that, whatever you, yeah. Okay, guys, we only have about eight minutes left. Who wants to give this a try? Five second rule. Okay, great. Adam, Adam and David again. This is, boy, they are really volunteers today, aren't they? <laughs> okay, you guys ready? It's the same link. You just have to go to sheet two. All right. Okay, David, you ready to go first? This isn't okay. too much. This isn't too much tension for you, is it? Uh, no, I don't think so. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Go ahead. And, go ahead, and, and you can start, and I, I will do the clock here. Okay, David. Yeah, I just put the. Uh, oh, you know, okay. Oh, you you have the O's. Oh, okay, one. Okay, David, or no, Adam, David. Okay, um, okay let's see. Three, four, one. five. Okay, yeah, I think you just got in under the wire. Okay. David? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Okay. Adam, David. Okay. Let's see. Uh, let's see. No, don't talk. It wastes time. David. Adam, I'm trying. I'm trying to pick out the uh, strategy here. Yeah, same. <laughs> you can see if there wasn't a time limit, this would take a long time. Okay. The funny part about this is sometimes you win and you don't even know you've won. I can definitely see that happening. <laughs> oh. Oh, David, I don't know. Okay, that was pretty long. Uh, did he go? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, David, yeah, David. Okay. Let's see. Okay. 
four, five. By the way, the good strategy here, you know how in tic-tac-toe you get, you get no matter where the other person moves, you have an alternative, you can still win? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can do the same thing here. And, and that's the good strategy to win. Did you go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I didn't see that. One, Adam. What? Okay. okay. All right. Uh, By the way, when, when you went, say. Gone. Done, yeah. Done. When oh, oh. David, he snuck it by you, man. Uh, oh, Let's see. So, uh, wait, uh, no, you win? won. No, you okay. won. Oh, I'm sorry, you won. Okay. Oh, wait, did, oh, did he go first? Oh, yeah, he did. He did. So, congratulations, David. So, oh, yep. At the end of two, it's Adam won and uh, and uh, David won. So that's it. He was ahead of me for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should we should have instilled that. I, we're, we're, next time we do this, you you have to say done, so you know that's like hitting that clock when you play chess. So anyway, mm -hmm. this is interesting. What you did is you just played a four dimensional game in three dimensions, in two dimensions, right? In two dimensions. Mm -hmm. Now uh, that's kind of crazy. Now, um, how about in five dimensions? You know, you feel like this little guy in Flatland. Okay, I kind of understand four dimensions, but five dimensions, that's really rough. Because what you get is you get a six by six array and a six by six array of six by six arrays. And I think this becomes beyond anything that I can keep track of. So this, what it, this is what it would be in five dimensions. It becomes kind of unwieldy. I don't think you can you can do that. So, but anyway, you know, you can see it's possible, and you can have fun and play tic tac toe in uh, four dimensions. They used to play chess by mail. Have you ever heard of that? Where you would mail something to everybody. Um, I want to end up here, and I'm going to run a couple minutes over. I hope that's okay. I want to end up here by visualization and business intelligence. And I think this is important for you guys, too, that have data to represent. Do you ever show a spreadsheet to somebody? And I see a spreadsheet, and if there's anything complicated at all, I just go, you know, it just becomes too crazy. There's a There's a better way to dimensionally represent data than to just plot it out or just to represent it on a spreadsheet. And here are some of the different dimensions you can use. You can use color, you can use space multiplexing, as we used in tic-tac-toe. We can use size, the larger the size means a bigger number, line thickness, uh, shape, texture, and time. Now this doesn't mean anything until I, I give you some examples. So let me do that. Here's an example, this is a matrix vector multiply. See, we have a matrix, we have a, uh, 
we have a vector, we have a matrix, and then we have another vector. Notice that we can represent this by a sagittal diagram. Sagittal means kind of spread out in a planar fashion, as you can see here. And the interconnects among the nodes are larger if the corresponding matrix element is larger. Do you see how this is a visual representation of this? Right? So that's one way, you know, one way to do it. And uh, you can do it, for example, in relating, like if we wanted to relate, um, instead of giving a spreadsheet of different universities to specialties, we could literally talk about the strength of the connection between a university and that result. Now here, the focus is on the university because you notice everything coming from Harvard is blue. Everything coming from Yale is red, correct? So this kind of says how Harvard, Yale, and Oxford are going to perform in these different results. You can switch it around and you can say, okay, I'm more interested in a, um, I'm more interested in a, in a field. And so you can work it backwards. Notice all the blue here is from economics. But you, can you see this? This represents a nice two-dimensional field in a very understandable way, and it's literally something you can look at and you can study and gather further insight into the relationships between the different universities and the different degrees. And can you see how this pops more than a spreadsheet would? It's understandable more than a spreadsheet would be. And this is used in business intelligence. I learned this from my son, who is a chief financial officer. He has to present boring spreadsheets all the time and data all the time. And it's really good if you can represent it in this sort of fashion. And he refers to it as business intelligence. Here is an interesting one. There's so much going on here, you could literally look at this for a long time. But we have uh, all of these different different organizations. Here we've added the dimension of how extensive the programs are. You know that Harvard's leg is thicker than, for example, Ohio State, meaning that there's more going on at Harvard in some sense than it's going on at, Harvard, at uh, Ohio State, right? Because the thickness of the line is different. Um, also, we've, we've have redundancy here because the thickness of the line is related to the font size of what describes it. And then as we go out from an individual program, such as Princeton, we see that Princeton begins bifurcating into these different elements, into engineering. Uh, we're following the yellow line here. It also goes up and it has something in law. So you can see that Princeton has a broad base, but you can see it's specialty in law, at least according to this. By the way, these are, these are not, this is not true data. It's how to represent the data. And, uh, so you can also see on the right here the agglomeration of them. Uh, let's look at engineering. We have brown, yellow, um, and um, I guess that's red. And if we take engineering and we, f we follow it back, at least from this representation, the place to go for West Virginia or for uh, engineering is where? Harvard, right? Because Harvard has the biggest engineering program of the results. So you can see a lot of data here and it's all dimensionally represented in things such as font, color, arrow sizes, and uh, you can get a lot of representation. And this, this, I submit to you, communicates better psychologically with the human than does just numbers on a spreadsheet. Okay, this one's literally pretty complicated. So with that, I think I'll stop. Next time we'll get into some of the mathematics of, of multidimensional signals and systems. But I wanted to present that business intelligence because I think most of you guys are writing memos and you're writing uh, papers. And you know, there's this tendency to just put numbers in there if you're doing something experimental. It's a lot better if you can express it more effectively using business intelligence graphics ideas because you can grab multi-dimensional concepts and you can relate them using arrow size, font size, color, uh, shape. We didn't use symbols, but symbols could also be used. Okay, any questions at all? Okay, next time we will uh, continue with uh, the lecture. We have those final few problems to work out now that I've corrected everything. You're welcome to hand them in or uh, or you can hand them in now, or you can wait until Thursday to hand them in. Uh, any questions at all?
Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.